Chairman, I have um, three o'clock on the nose and I note that uh, we've got 66 attendees at the meeting. I would think they will come, continue to come in. Um, I will turn it over to you in a minute. For those of you that are on the line, uh, you'll see that some people are visible and, uh, and have the ability to turn their microphones on and off. The reason for that is, and we'll discuss this again, under the CBOC executive, uh, under the CBOC uh, governance document, there are designated uh, votes and the votes are designated to the four officials commissioners, Tim Hyde, John McFarlane, Martha Bradbury, and Georgia Resnita. And each of the provincial basketball officials associations, the 10 across the country, get a vote. So the people that we brought into the room are those that um, have a vote. We've brought in our committee and working group chairs, and we've brought in the balance of the CBOC executive committee. I don't know that they're all in the room at the moment, but Melanie Jiren Moget representing the CCAA, uh, Krista Ina Jokin representing U Sports, Rob Wright representing Canada Basketball, and an ex officio member of the CBOC executive committee uh, or executive council, uh, Glenn Grunwald, the president and CEO of Canada Basketball. Uh, Ron Young, the Canada Basketball Director of Domestic Development who attends uh, all of the CBOC uh, Executive Council meetings is also brought in as he will be speaking on the budget tonight. So that's a, a little bit of a background. Ricky has the agenda up. Tim, if I can turn it over to you and uh, we can kick off the first ever annual general meeting of CBOC the Canada Basketball Officials Commission. And for those of you that are muted online, the question and answer is available. Uh, if you've got question and answers that come up, myself, Ricky, and Georgia will try and uh, monitor those and, uh, and deal with them as we go. Thank you, Mike. Uh, first order of business, um, I would... Uh, like to just uh, have a quick review of the agenda and um, any of those with voting rights um, have any objections to the agenda or any additions to suggest. Now is your opportunity. And not seeing any, we will consider the agenda approved then as was circulated. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, good afternoon for those of you in Western Canada. And uh, welcome, as Mike mentioned, to the uh, 2021 and first ever CBOC AGM. Uh, we don't expect um, any business to be conducted today. Um, however, Robert's rules will be the guide for conducting the meeting. Uh, we have uh, a, a tight timeline and a, a very full agenda. Uh, the meeting will consist primarily of uh, reporting. However, again, <clears throat> as Mike mentioned, the uh, Q&A and the hands up uh, for questions features are available. Uh, speakers, um, I, I would just simply ask that um, you be cognizant of the time allotted and uh, consider yourself on the clock. Um, answers to questions will be uh, fairly brief considering the time constraint. Uh, however, uh, pending how successful we are at navigating the agenda, uh, there may be opportunity to expand on a question or two during uh, open forum. Uh, other questions that aren't able to be answered either in the uh, course of business or um, in the open forum uh, may be addressed offline or uh, in other formats or perhaps even at a future president's meeting. Um, as Mike uh, mentioned, he will monitor uh, where a speaker may need to be recognized and uh, uh, will do so if and when necessary. Uh, Mike um, introduced the executive council. 
Uh, I won't repeat that, uh, but I will also, uh, or would also like to just note <clears throat> that um, of the members of the National Count of the uh, Executive Council, uh, John McFarland, National Educator, is also uh, Chair of the National Tournament Selection and Evaluation Committee. Uh, Martha Bradbury, in addition to Secretary Treasurer, is Chair of the Cable Legacy Awards and Recognition Committee and Co-Chair of the Financial Planning Working Group. Uh, I uh, also chair the uh, membership and registration working group. Rob Wright, uh, vice chair of Canada Basketball, is also co-chair of the financial planning working group and risk management working group. And um, I'd also like to introduce the uh, committee and working group chairs that have not already been noted. Uh, Education and Development Committee, Nadine Crowley. The Rules Education and Exam Committee, Cam Osco. And co-chair of the Recruitment and Retention Committee, Rick Parnum. Uh, provincial and Territorial Sport Organization Executive Directors um, that um, had registered as of yesterday afternoon and I believe are uh, present. Adam Wedlake, uh, Manitoba. Rami Ayash of Northwest Territories. Uh, now, Judy Byrne had registered, but I believe um, she's been replaced uh, by another representative. I'm sorry, Mike, I don't have the name in front of me. Is it Karen? Karen, Karen Adam. Thank you. I think, it, I think it's Karen Adam. I apologize. I should look if, I, if I've erred in saying that, but I believe that's who it is. Uh, and um, Carolyn Pepin uh, of New, New Brunswick. If there are any other provincial, territorial, sport organization, executive directors, or even presidents that are in attendance, um, I apologize. Um, I don't have um, an up-to-date registration list as of uh, this morning. Uh, provincial officials, organization reps that are present uh, on the call. Um, from BC and representing the BC Basketball Officials Commission, Kerry Rokosh, uh, Alberta Basketball Officials Association President, Perry Stothard, Saskatchewan Association of Basketball Officials President, Michael Champion, Manitoba Association of Basketball Officials President, Stacey Hawash, Ontario Association of Basketball Officials President, Rick Parnham, CPA Vice President, Max Audet, uh, New Brunswick, Association of, sorry, yeah, New Brunswick Association of Amateur Basketball Officials, Adam Humphrey, uh, representing uh, Nova Scotia's Basketball Officials Association was to be Paul Hansen, I believe that's been replaced. Uh, and again, Mike, I'm sorry, I don't have the name in front of me. Chris Holland, and I know Chris Holland is on the call. Um, Tim, if I apologize, if I can uh, note, Rike, we've got a couple of people that have put uh, questions in that I'm answering. Uh, Tino and Krista have both indicated that what I think there's, they're not actually seeing the agenda up. They're just seeing that you've started to share your screen. Yeah, that's the same thing I can see, Mike. Okay, I'll come out of the share and then do it again. It was fine for me. I can, I can certainly see the screen. Well, Rike is working on that. Just the last uh, three introductions, president of the PEI Basketball Officials Association, Brian Linton, president of the Newfoundland Basketball Officials Association, Fred Wakeham, and representing the Yukon Territory officials, Paul Boutra. Mike, um, we'll now um, share a bit of information uh, and walk us through the meeting format. Mike, uh, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. If somebody can confirm with me that some of you are seeing the document I brought up on the screen, uh, Georgia says yes. So, ladies and I gentlemen, what I, what I brought up is the CBOC governance document. I'm not going to walk through the document here. All I want to do is let people know that this is the document that was created when CABO merged 
uh, into Canada basketball, became a committee of Canada basketball under the CBOC, the Canadian Basketball Officials Association. This is the government that we a document that we use to determine how we govern ourselves and conduct meetings. Uh, this document cover, covers a number of topics uh, all the way through, uh, sets up our major committees, um, our major roles. Um, this particular piece on page four uh, covers the elections, which will uh, govern how we run ourselves today. I do note that this document was built before we actually got operating. And as we've learned in our first year, there are some things that we may not have done well. One of them is in this particular item that we're talking about now, which is the budget piece. Uh, in this document, it indicates that we would bring the budget to the AGM for approval. Uh, as we've learned in the Canada basketball operating principles with the fiscal year kicking off on April 1st each year, we're really in a position that the CBOC portion of the budget needs to be completed in December, January to fit into that planning cycle. So we'll have to make some adjustments in the CBOC governance document, which we'll do over the next year. Uh, I am just going to uh, go through this and then I'm going to move to the document on the voters we identified. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to go back and into this section here um, and just walk through. This is the section that defines for us the actual voters, the, then our composition of our uh, executive committee and uh, it's, it's the document, it should be available on game plan for those of you that are interested in having a look at it. It was certainly shared with all the PBOA presidents at uh, the beginning of time. I'm gonna take that off of share and what I'm gonna try and share next is our document. Okay. Um, I've just got to, I knew this would happen. I've got too many things open in the background. Uh, hopefully that will allow me to find that document in the share now. So this is the, uh, what Tim referred to in terms of the voting eligibility. For those of you that are wondering why there are no elections or votes this particular year, the way the governance document set up the initial transitory appointments of the commissioners, they were appointments. So Tim Hyde's role as chair expires in 2023. So two years from now, there would be an election for that position. Uh, Martha Bradbury and John McFarland, their transitory appointments expire a year from now. And so there will be an election a year from now for the secretary treasurer and the national educator uh, and vice chair role. And Georgia, as the director of large, her transitory appointment expires in 2023. So that's two years away. The, um, each of the provinces were asked to declare in advance who would carry their vote. Uh, as Tim noted, with the creation of BC BOC or the BC Basketball Officials Commission uh, commencing a couple of weeks ago, uh, Kerry Rokosh has that vote tonight. Generally, it's the provincial presidents that are holding the vote. In Quebec, it's Max Odette, the vice president, and in Nova Scotia, uh, Chris Holland, who I believe, Chris, you're the provincial educator in Nova Scotia, will, will have any votes that we have tonight. So I wanted to just provide that as some information. I will come off of that, and if I can, as I noted with the uh, budget, we're not approving the budget today, but we've asked Rong Young to uh, show us the budget and provide everybody a little bit of background to let everybody know sort of how the finances are set up. Ron, are you in a position to uh, take the share and do that? Yep. Great. Well, I, can certainly, I can certainly see it and it's up. Awesome. Hello everyone. Uh, as per uh, Mike just spoken of, um, the, what you're seeing in front of you is our CBOC budget for this upcoming fiscal year, falling in line with Canada Basketball's fiscal year of April 1st to March 31st. Um, this is sort of an exercise that we do 
usually around February to kind of line up what we're thinking for the upcoming year. Um, as in anything, this is obviously, a, 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 I wouldn't say a rough stat, but, but it's definitely an estimate in terms of what we envision for this upcoming year. Uh, the challenge with a lot of this, there's a couple of factors here. One being that CBOC is relatively new. This is now going into second year of operation. So there's still a lot of sort of, you know, spendings, revenues, generation, all of those pieces that aren't really sort of on a year to year basis that we have something that we can reference against. So a lot of this is still really sort of, it's kind of throwing numbers out to kind of see how comfortable we are and, and sticking with it. The other part obviously is the pandemic, uh, you know, with the uncertainties around the pandemic, uh, it was certainly a tough one in year one with this operation of CBOC, trying to land around the membership, different pieces that are related to education and uniform. Um, but, you know, there's no different going into this upcoming year as well. Um, you know, as we are slowly seeing sort of the pandemic trending towards a better position, we're still not out of it yet. And so we really don't know exactly where basketball will be come all of this year. Um, so we are taking an approach being somewhat conservative, um, but also with a mindset that there will potentially be some basketball. Um, but as we look at the revenue side of this budget, uh, as it relates to membership, we are still being conservative in estimating that we will have a drop in roughly 20% compared to the full year that we had back in 2019. And so we're looking at roughly about 3,500 in membership, uh, capturing membership for CBOC. But again, that's these are really tough estimate that we are kind of banking on what we think, um, but not necessarily something that we are knowing that it's gonna happen. Um, so the whole exercise, I won't go line by line, but really the whole purpose of showing you guys this budget is to kind of, for everyone to be able to see sort of the thought process around the various revenue lines and expenses line uh, that goes along with the CBOC budget. Um, so on total revenue side, we are projecting a total revenue of around 318,000 for the upcoming season. Uh, the expenses side categorized into staffing and operations, uh, education, evaluations, meetings, membership and slash scholarship, uh, international fee, uniform and official schools uh, and total expenses are roughly going to be at about 349,000, which will land us in a, a, a loss of 30, roughly around 30,000 in this second year. Uh, we knew we were going to first few years is going to be enduring a loss, um, but this is sort of just an exercise that we are going through. A lot can change. Um, and again, based on the pandemic, based on where basketball will be, uh, this is again, a, a, a a really quick overview of what our budget looks like for this upcoming year. Thank you. Enrique, I do note that we have one hand rate raised. We have a Terrace Brunk that has raised a hand. Are you able to uh, bring Terrence in to ask a question? Yep, one second. It looks like he's put his hand down. I noticed uh, I noticed quickly Craig Montebelli's hand went up, but I think Craig's hand is is down as I scroll through. Yeah, Craig's hand is down as well. Thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt, Ron. Um, no, I'm certainly done. And then uh, again, Mike, if there's anything you uh, that needs to get added on, or if there's any specific areas that we need to talk to and weren't open to open them. Pause for a second. And I see nothing in the question and answer or, or chat on, on this matter. So uh, thank you very much for that review. That's great. And Tim will turn it back to you. And as we turn it back to Tim for the chair's report, um, we'll try and have Rike share the screen and the chair's report. And if somebody can indicate if we still have the problem with the shared screen, um, we can try and do it from, from my computer. Thank you. You're, you're on mute, Tim. Of course I am. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Ron. Uh, it's certainly been an interesting year uh, for
for, as we all know, many reasons. Uh, but at the same time, uh, from a, uh, an officiating perspective regarding uh, the integration of, of officiating community into Canada basketball, it has been um, an eye-opening year, but an exciting year. Um, I'm honored to preside over the inaugural CBOC AGM. Uh, the shoes of past cable presidents and executives are, are certainly large ones to fill, um, especially when we consider that in all the years uh, that they managed responsibilities, they did so strictly as volunteers and with no staff support. Uh, the role of chair of CBOC certainly encompasses uh, most, if not all, of uh, what past cable president's roles would have included, but uh, now includes the broader scope of leading and guiding the Canadian officiating continuum as we continue to integrate into the national sport organization, Canada Basketball, and the respective provincial territorial sport organizations. The past 12 months has seen the Executive Council focused on developing a foundation for uh, the design of a future landscape of officiating in Canada. Um, lots to build on, uh, but that has uh, the foundation will need to be established before uh, uh, too much uh, building above ground can be uh, accomplished successfully. Uh, for those who haven't um, searched out Executive Council minutes on game plan. Um, I, I certainly encourage you to do so. Uh, they're posted there to provide transparency, uh, to encourage comment and question, uh, to provide a window for CBOC members to see uh, how the Executive Council functions, um, what are identified as priorities, and uh, how those priorities are being addressed. Um, I'd encourage every member to uh, have a look and uh, submit comments and questions to your respective provincial representative or president uh, who can share them with us um, as Mike and I meet with them monthly. Uh, COVID certainly has been an unpredictable and unprecedented tragedy. It's created tremendous challenges for everyone, every organization, every business, every industry, every family. But in spite of that, I'm especially pleased with the substantial progress and accomplishment that the CBOC has experienced in this trying year for sure. Um, memberships, membership totals um, are roughly two thirds of previous years, but considering the circumstances, I have to say I'm very pleased. And frankly, I wanna thank each member for their commitment and, and not just simply for digging 35 bucks out of your pocket but for doing your part to stay and be ready to referee when it's again safe to do so. I wanna thank the uh, PBOA uh, presidents uh, for meeting the challenge of maintaining meaningful connection with uh, respective members and for supporting and sharing the CBOC vision. Uh, I think uh, I, I need to acknowledge the Development and Education Committee, uh, the enormous time and effort um, that this committee has, has, has invested didn't just start with the transition to CBOC. Uh, this has been work that has been in progress for nearly six years now. Um, the, the work that they are doing and have done is fantastic. Educational and informational webinars, uh, I guess, in the past um, were perhaps unique and uh, few and far between, but uh, there are many available around or from around the world these days. Um, CBOC is, is producing and designing uh, many specifically to meet the needs of CBOC members. Uh, an example of that is uh, this coming weekend, the uh, CB uh, Super Clinic, which for the first time will include a two-day series that's available to all members who register for it. And uh, this series is dedicated to officiating in Canada. Acknowledgement is um, necessary to the uh, Cable Legacy and Awards and Recognition Committee. Um, the award celebration for um, 
the typical awards and recognition that uh, CABO in the past has uh, presented uh, were again held this year. Uh, in this case, uh, it was held virtually, uh, but for those that uh, weren't able to join that celebration, uh, I must say it was a terrific evening and the committee should be congratulated. The Executive Council has struck four working groups to address some of the highest of the uh, of a lengthy list of priorities. I'll just uh, identify the four quickly. Uh, membership and registration working group, a recruitment and retention working group, a financial planning working group, risk management working group, which is primarily considering insurance. Um, that group, risk management working group, has been temporarily paused to allow Canada Basketball to complete research and assessment of the potential for a national insurance policy that would provide coverage for all Canada Basketball members. CBOC will be a key component to Canada Basketball's success in reaching its stated goal of aligning stakeholders and creating a unified basketball nation. Officiating is is the hub within the sport that ties stakeholders together. And to that end, the Executive Council has prioritized encouragement and support for transitioning existing PBOAs to provincial basketball officials commissions, which fit, which will and, and should fit into the governance structure of the respective PTSO. Preliminary conversations have occurred with most of the PTSOs. Uh, BC, as mentioned earlier, has recently completed its transition to BC Basketball Officials Commission, while Saskatchewan Basketball is in the process of finalizing a timeline for its transition to a commission as well. Creation of CBOC as a committee of Canada Basketball has provided a direct connection now to FIBA and FIBA America's referee departments which didn't exist previously. This provides membership with immediate availability of the, last, of the latest rule and interpretation updates, access to coordinated, uh, coordinated access rather to FIBA-based training resources and opportunities for FIBA referee instructor program certification. Mike Thompson is a member of FIBA's rules advisory group which essentially gives CBOC insiders access, and I put that in quotations, um, and CBOC membership then updates and information as accurately and timely as quite frankly as possible. Uh, CBOC has, uh, is in the process of developing relationship with the uh, Canadian Elite Basketball League. Uh, the relationship is intended to provide the league's officiating department with resources and guidance and the CBOC with an opportunity to build on a high performance pathway concept. That relationship continues to evolve. As an integral department of Canada basketball, CBOC has been included in some conversations that in the past would typically have been rather peripheral, I would suggest, uh, within the context of Cable National Council's attention. Firstly, the subject of equality, diversity, and, inclu and inclusion has been a focus for Canada basketball this past year. And in the fall of 2020, the Unified 2024 Advisory Council was established, which includes CBOC members Nadine Crowley and Artaban Azadarat. CBOC fully supports the recently announced Canada basketball diversity statement and equity commitments and is committed to developing strategies to create a culture of equity and to removing existing barriers. I challenge each CBOC member to read the announcement, assess your personal self-awareness and effort to make a difference in empowering an equitable, diverse and inclusive officiating culture. Secondly, the month of March was designated Women in Basketball Month and CBOC produced and presented a week of programming focused on women's participation in various contexts as they relate to officiating. The week's series of presentations I found to be inspiring, thought provoking, and quite frankly, left me feeling that there is enormous potential for the growth of officiating in Canada, 
providing we all embrace a culture of equality. A CBOC priority is to stay connected. Uh, CBOC hosts monthly Zoom meetings with the respective PBOA representatives. Mike Thompson joins monthly meetings with Canada Basketball and PTSO executive directors to provide CBOC updates and to answer questions. CBOC members can access learning resources, executive council minute meetings, and whistle blast through their game plan account, while whistle blast and time sensitive information is also sent directly to all registered members via email. Noteworthy announcements are also noted in Canada Basketball's news postings, and you likely have seen some on social media platforms as well. I want to congratulate each of CBOC's FIBA licensed referees and commissioners, as well as FIBA certified instructors who have received appointment to international tournaments over the next few months. The number of appointments in each of these categories rivals those of any country on the globe. Canada's reputation is very strong and it continues to grow. The workload of, of the referee department at Canada Basketball during the past year could not have been predicted. With the transition to CBOC, uh, there are many things that many of us, maybe all of us feel should now be possible. Uh, and quite frankly, if they're not already on the list of priorities, they soon will be, but we must all be patient and manage our expectations while the foundation mentioned earlier takes shape and strategic planning evolves. Rike and Mike are working well beyond capacity. They have provided tremendous support to the executive council, various committees and working groups, and have been key to connecting the officiating dots with the other departments of Canada basketball. I personally can't thank them enough, and I hope that if and when you have a chance, you're able to do so as well. I want to thank Ron Young and Gren Grunwald for their support and participation in executive council meetings. Thanks to the chairs and members of the respective committees and working groups for their hard work. And in closing, I want to thank the members of the executive council for their diligent contribution during this challenging year and for their commitment and responsibility to the stewardship of officiating. Thank you. Well, if it's okay, Tim, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to uh, thank you for that report. Uh, we do note that the report requires no action and as such, it uh, will be placed on file. It is posted in game plan and available to those that are in attendance today or anybody else wishing to have access. And if we're okay, I'll let you turn it over to the uh, next item of business, um, noting that uh, John McFarland will actually combine both item five, his national educators report, and his item 6B, national tournament selection and evaluation committee into a single report for us. Thank you, Mike. John, the podium is yours. Thank you, Tim. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's been, not to harp on it, but uh, it's, been, it's been a weird year. Uh, We've worked really, really hard to provide an experience for referees outside of the gymnasium this year. And uh, I, I, hearing feedback from, from the officials, I think we, we've, we've reached that goal. So I'm gonna talk about five things. I'm gonna to touch on five things. The Dean Crowley is gonna expand on the NOCP program and the work done there. So I won't spend much time on that. First thing I'll talk about is our referee coaches panel. Um, we have 31, currently have 31 national referee coaches in Canada. Um, we'd like to thank Sigurd Nielsen of New Brunswick, who recently retired from the panel, and thank him for, for his exemplary service. Um, as you know, we, we went a full year without any referee coaches opportunities, um, and that's been difficult. Uh, so moving forward, we'll offer some training and development for this panel. That's one of our goals. And I'm working with Mike and our uh, executive council to look at that in the near future. <coughs> Secondly, national champ championship tournaments. Um, we've missed two cycles of the under 15 and under 17 tournaments, um, as well as college. So we've, uh, two for two years, we haven't had any referees able to show us what they can do on the court. Um, 
And we have to examine that when we, when we go out for our next uh, cycle of nominations. Um, it's really eliminated the pandemic has eliminated a full year of basketball of competition and development opportunities for referees. Um, so we will we'll work very diligently to enhance our 22 championships to maximize learning opportunities for referees and referee coaches. NOC pro, NOCP program, Tim talked about it. Uh, it's been uh, a long process. Um, it involves uh, referees across the country. I said we've spent the last two years working collaboratively, but that's kind of the action plan we've put into place. And in the last two years, we've actually produced some uh, outstanding results. The NOCP one and two programs are really, really well done, well developed, aligned very closely to the FIBA model, uh, are modern, are current, have some excellent uh, video and graphics, and are very professionally done. So really proud of that. Um, Nadine Crowley has done a magnificent job of, of steward stewarding this program. Uh, as I mentioned, NOCP1 and NOCP2 are, are in the finalization stages of, of development. Um, we'll do an NOCP program run through on June, sec June 13th, and then we'll have those materials ready for rollout in September. Um, the new materials include uh, an excellent pro uh, participant workbook, as well as uh, delivery notes for the clinician and it, it makes the, the work very seamless. One of the goals of the NOCP program is consistency across the country of Canada, and we think we're going, going to get there uh, with, with this NOCP program. Um, Mike and Tim both thanked Rike. Rike has been wonderful. Uh, thank you, Rike, for all you do to keep us on task and behind the scenes. Um, we talked about uh, Pivoting in COVID times, we were able to offer uh, five NOCP uh, one courses on Zoom. Um, we trained uh, about 20 uh, clinicians on that, uh, on that platform. And we're re really pleased that we're able to, uh, during the COVID times, at least maintain a semblance of some professional development for officials. So really pleased with that. Um, Tim mentioned also uh, the online learning that we're, we were able to, to, uh, to, to uh, offer in the last year, and it's been uh, wonderful. Um, I see lots of opportunity post-pandemic as well. It's an it's, it's a inexpensive way to uh, offer, offer development and easy to, to connect the country from end to end. Having, having said that, I'd like to thank the Executive Council for the work this year. Uh, gracious thanks to Rike, Ron, Glenn, and Mike. Um, made our job much easier. Uh, Nadine Crowley, as I mentioned, has been stellar in everything that she has done. And to all the folks across the country that have sent, uh, spent time on committees and uh, asked, done anything we've asked of them, thank you to you for, for uh, being the wall that's, that's holding us up. And, uh, I look forward to our next year, and I, I really much look forward to getting back on the court in hopefully September of this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That takes us uh, uh, through one of the committee reports, and um, we'll, uh, we'll move to um, item 6A and the Development and Education Committee report. And I'll ask uh, Nadine Crowley to uh, share a summary of, uh, of the uh, committee report. Nadine. Thank you very much, Tim. It's good to see you. Good to see all of you. All right. I, um, what I did is I just, I'm just going to go through this quickly um, to sort of summarize my report. And I want to uh, talk about the achievements of the um, Development and Education Committee. And I think, you know, the biggest achievement is um, our, the consistency um, of contribution of the group. Uh, throughout COVID, um, the group met on a bi-monthly basis 
Um, we were meeting on a monthly basis prior to COVID and I thought, okay, I'll give them a break. And so uh, on a bi-monthly basis, but uh, during that time, people continued to work um, and continued their commitment um, towards, you know, providing some education for the um, CBOC members. So I really, really want to extend um, my thank yous to my 13 member crew. Um, and uh, I have to say that uh, Darren Patku from uh, Manitoba wins the award um, of, of um, <laughs> reading my report because I erred uh, in um, saying that uh, Martha Bradbury and Cam Mas Moskal were from Minnesota as opposed to Manitoba. So thank you for that. I will correct it and have done so already. So. Maybe. Uh, Yes. Nadine, I, I gather you're not aware that with the rising COVID-19 numbers and the pandemic in Manitoba, that in fact, Martha and Cam have moved to Minnesota. So you were actually correct. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I've worked with them so long. I, I, you know, I know, I know I can tell what they're going to do. Anyways, um, so thank you very much, Darren, for that correction. Um, and again, I also want to thank Ron Young and um, Rike and Mike um, Thompson for uh, joining the group and for really uh, supporting us and helping shepherd us along. Um, you know, just like John said, uh, great news with respect to the NOCP educational curriculum. Um, the majority of our CBOC members are at level one, two, and and sort of three. Um, so, you know, we have um, finalized the NOCP um, uh, educational curriculum for those levels. Like John said, we've already uh, done a few training sessions um, starting back in November and then again in January and then during the Women in Basketball Month in, in March um, and plan to do a pilot on June 13th for the level two. The awesome thing about this educational curriculum is that, you know, um, our group pivoted pretty fast to put this online. So it's a great uh, online program, uh, four hours, um, and uh, it would be coupled with the in-gym session um, in order to be fully trained and then the exam. Um, with this, curriculum program, they don't just get the online materials, but whoever's participating it will uh, be provided with a referee workbook that they can utilize during the course, but also keep with them throughout the year, add things to it, um, and sort of use it as their sort of yearly diary. Um, with respect to the learning facilitators, like John mentioned, we've trained a few across the country to be able to um, conduct these sessions. And what comes with that is a learning facilitator's guide. So um, Enrique was very instrumental at putting all of this, this package together. And it's a wonderful package. And what we're trying to do is flow seamlessly between the levels um, so that, you know, when an official moves from one level to the next, there's a bit of review, but then some new material um, as they work up to level four. Um, other things that the uh, Development and Education Committee do, we've created a few tools um, which are posted on game plan. Some of those tools, uh, like a one pager on IOTs, uh, the IOT, there's an IOT video uh, that's on there. Uh, there's an unsportsmanlike foul video that's, that's been posted on, on game plan. There's also, um, uh, John created a one page uh, teaching manual for spring and summer camps um, as to what type of highlighting the various topics that should be, should be taught at these camps uh, to assist with that. So there's a lot of little things that we've done and posted on game plan that are helpful to our members. Uh, the education webinars, which have been talked about, um, I, you know, uh, I was really super happy uh, about these education webinars from the perspective that it included a lot of people. 
And it started out with um, uh, Matt Callio and the Alberta um, Association uh, wanting to, to, to provide education this way. And then we just carried the ball after that. Um, and one of the, um, and we've had, you know, webinars and people from around the world uh, who have participated in this. Um, uh, we had a leadership um, uh, webinar um, from uh, a fellow referee in the States, and we had um, a uh, sports psychology webinar from a uh, sports psychologist in Croatia. So uh, we hope that come September, we can continue to have uh, host these webinars and to continue to provide education across the country. The other thing I'm really happy about and that, that's really different about the CBOC is that, um, you know, a lot of, a few other provinces have come on board to provide webinars. For example, Ontario, um, you know, had Dan Este um, provide some webinars with some referees around the country. And recently uh, there was a three-person uh, three webinar with um, uh, Ontario. And, and they collaborated with Mike Thompson and the CBOC to put these on. And that's great. And that's great to get people from around the country contributing. Um, so that's wonderful to the education of our members. Also, we have other various projects in progress um, such as the uh, NLCP uh, introductory level. Uh, we're working on that right now. Um, and also NLCP uh, through level three and level four. Um, and we'll go to the next slide because that just carries us nicely into what's next. So what's planned? Well, um, something that we've been working on for quite a while, and um, hopefully we're, we're, we're seeing some light at the end of the tunnel, is the NLC Development uh, Level Guidebook. And what that guidebook, what we hope that guidebook will achieve, will be a map for everyone to see how to move through the NOCP levels, and will provide explanation as to how to get through. So I think uh, I'm, I'm really excited for us to be able to showcase that. Um, and I hope that that will come in the fall. I, like I already talked about, we're piloting at a level two on June 13th, um, uh, completion of level zero, three and four of the NOCP. Also looking at how are we gonna roll out, you know, the NOCP levels in provinces and the in gym sessions. So that is something that we're still working on. Um, we're also it, hand in hand with the NLCP curriculum. We're working to continue to work on training the learning facilitators to be able to facilitate um, each of those courses. Uh, in September, <clears throat> we're starting our education webinars uh, again. Um, so stay tuned uh, to see what's coming next. We have a few in the hop. Um, and like John talked about, the further development of the referee coach program, and we, um, we've piloted the high performance pathway uh, with a group of 40 officials or 40 plus officials uh, from across Canada, and we hope to touch base with them in September again, just to follow up, but also to continue them uh, to move them along the path, and these are young up and coming, but also not just young up and comers, but um, referees who may be refereeing at the college or in or university level who um, are ready to take the next step uh, from maybe U2 or U1 to crew chief. So um, it's, uh, we started off with a great series um, from our sports psychologist from Croatia, Dubrovka Martinovic. Um, on uh, a five-part series and a four-part series, sorry. And uh, we hope to get her back again in the fall to continue that. So that's, that's what's next. I'm sure I've missed a few things uh, because we always have so much going on, but um, I really, I'm looking forward to 
the fall <laughs> in the hopes that we could get back on the court and people can start utilizing some of the skills that they learned in the NLCP course and that we can do a bit more with this. So thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the time. Thank you, Nadine. Fantastic work, foundational to sustaining a quality officiating community for the country and for the sport. Jim, just before you go to the next report, if I can, there's one question in the question and answer, which I'll read for Nadine. Um, Nadine, you're not going to be able to answer the whole question, but maybe you can provide some guidance. So from uh, Greg Oliver, who I believe is in Newfoundland, will the NOCP level zero curriculum be available for September, October this year? And if so, will it be virtual or in-person training and estimated length of training in hours? I think you can probably uh, leave parts of that alone, but I'll let you answer what you can. Yeah, well, I hope it's going to be available for the fall. That's, that's, the, um, that's, that's the intent. Uh, with respect to online, we haven't decided whether it's going to be a self-study um, or a, an actual presentation. So I think it, it depends on the material uh, that we're putting together. Um, so that I, really, that's about all I can answer. Um, it's, it's still a work in progress, and we're not really sure. It was intended, level zero was intended to be a self-study where anybody can go on and access that. Um, and also you don't even uh, have to be a member. It would probably, we probably just put it up on game plan and uh, anybody can access because really it's targeted towards, um, you know, a parent who wants to referee their kid's rec team or maybe um, working with, you know, club, club teams and having their kids referee. Uh, it's just to provide that bit of basketball referee knowledge to those who might be interested just to, to do it on a recreational basis. Thank you, Nadine. Back to you, Tim, to carry on. Thanks again, Nadine. Uh, we'll move to uh, the report of the Rules Education and Exam Committee. Um, Cam Oskell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, depending on what part of the country you're from. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to, to uh, report on the Rules Education Exam Committee's um, first ever annual general meeting report. Um, you have my report submitted, so I won't go into it in great detail. And with, considering the five minute time frame, I'll just kind of give you top line um, information for you. Uh, the committee was uh, was started in June of 2020, and uh, at that time, uh, I approached two individuals to serve with me on the um, on this committee, and that was Scott uh, Critch from Newfoundland and Labrador, and Sebastian Goche out of uh, out of Quebec, and both uh, both accepted my invitation. Uh, both individuals were uh, involved with me on a quite regular basis in my previous role as national interpreter uh, of CABO in regards to rules interpretations and, and dialogue throughout the year. So they both uh, made a great addition to this committee. So I want to thank both of them uh, at this time. Um, most of our um, responsibilities on this committee, obviously the two big projects are the national rules exam and the uh, national points of emphasis document for the year. Um, in the exam, a lot of the work is done in a very short period of time, usually over uh, you know eight, eight to 10 weeks of heading into the fall. We started a little earlier this year than what historically uh, ha has been the case. Um, we reached out to provincial contacts on the national exam in, uh, in July to provide any feedback, rules questions, any kind of information and dialogue to, to the committee with a deadline of August 9th. So we started a couple of months sooner than we would normally do. Um, which was great. And we started to develop the, the exam at that time. So I want to just uh, thank uh, Sebastian Goche. He not only serves in the committee, but he also serves as our exam translator. Because um, often translating into uh, the French language, uh, if you're not a basketball official person, some of the, the translation gets lost uh, if it's not done correctly. So thanks, Sebastian, for that. Um, we looked at um, uh, adding some new items to the to the exam this year and obviously with co the COVID situation we weren't sure if there's going to be any basketball uh, played in this country or not but uh, 
we, we did deliver the exam and added both a, a French and English uh, version on game plan, which I think was very uh, beneficial to any official that wanted to see uh, both of, uh, languages as they're writing the exam. So that was a great addition. Uh, we had the original exam writing period scheduled for November 6th to the 18th, and then a rewrite uh, anytime after uh, if you didn't achieve your um, required mark. Um, Post-exam uh, post writing period, um, all officials were, uh, were provided with their uh, complete results of the exam uh, through the game plan uh, platform and with references to the FIBA rules articles and interpretations. So a lot of inf information provided um, along those lines. And I just wanted to call out, I know many others have and, and will, will continue to do so, but I just want to thank Rike at Canada Basketball for all, all her outstanding work and getting the exam set up uh, and also providing support throughout the process as well. So thanks Rike for that, uh, very much appreciated. Um, part of this committee also makes recommendations for next year's exam. So we, uh, we've done that and we'll continue to, to do that over the course of the summer. Um, just some of the things to look forward to for uh, consideration for future exams is the possibility of adding video questions to the uh, national exam. I think with a platform like Game Plan and the uh, access to technology we have through the CB, uh, CB office, that this might be something we could look at possibly even for the next exam this year. So, and then we also talked about anything about adding audio, an audio component to the exam as well. So those are some of the, some of the things that we'll look at for, uh, for future exams. In terms of points of emphasis document, um, that's a document that comes out of this committee as well. We began work on that in October of 2020, um, and we submitted the final document back to Mike Thompson on December 20th. Now, obviously, with COVID-19 and the, uh, the limited amount of basketball being played, we kept the points of emphasis for this past 2021 season the same as they were previously. Uh, and just made revisions to, uh, to any content that needed to be revised due to rule or and or interpretation changes. So we kept them the same and we look forward to doing, and we, I guess the big thing out of that is we, we did provide an audio version um, of the points of emphasis uh, and hopefully that helped out and we'll look to improve upon that delivery mechanism going forward. Um, so just uh, looking forward, uh, this committee also through the terms of reference, uh, we, we have some deadlines to provide back to the CBOC uh, executive, executive committee uh, in terms of recommendations for next year and setting up policies, more policies of this committee. So we'll do that. And I've listed them in my report as well. So just in closing, I uh, certainly just like to thank uh, uh, Canada Basketball Board of Directors, the CBOC Executive Council, Executive Committee, all the standing committees and the CBOC working groups for their continued support, dedication and vision to this overall governance model of CBOC and its, and its purpose. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank uh, all the Canada Basketball staff members and those obviously who oversee the day-to-day -day operations of CBOC. Uh, and those namely Mike Thompson, our manager of officials development, Enrique Olasina, coordinator uh, for their overwhelming support and professionalism and dedication throughout the year. So thanks to everybody. I will uh, entertain any questions if there are any. Pam, at the moment, there are no questions in the question and answer. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for the um, report. Thank you. Thank you, Cam. Some very interesting and progressive initiatives uh, uh, involved there. Um, exciting to see. Uh, that takes us to um, the uh, two updates um, from the four working groups um, I mentioned earlier. I'm sorry, uh, my apologies. Um, we have one committee report remaining. Um, the last of the committee reports, uh, the Cable Legacy and Awards and Recognition Committee, um, Martha Bradbury Chair, um, the floor is yours to summarize your report. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everybody. Uh, in the interest of time, and, and as everyone else did, I submitted my report, so I'm just going to touch on some really quick points. Um, like everyone else, obviously this was the inaugural year for the the um, Cable Legacy and Awards um, and Recognition Committee. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, I worked with um, Neil Donnelly and Jim Walsh. Um, Jim in particular is a very valuable member of, of the committee because he really holds a lot of history and knows a lot about Cabo. Um, and it just is really important to preserve obviously Cabo's legacy in all of this. Um, we awarded five Wink Willocks Awards this year. And I just wanna sort of call out what with everybody on the call that in the past, it's always been that we award, you know, provided the, the uh, nominees meet all the requirements. We award those um, one, one per province. We only had five provinces apply this year. So I just want to remind provinces to get those applications in. Um, there are a lot of very, um, um, you know, deserving officials for these awards. Um, we awarded seven Rich and Security Scholarships. Um, we did not award the camp bursary that was applied for, but only because the person that applied had received a camp bursary the prior year. Um, we did award a TED early um, to Cam Moscow. That's, a, that's not an award that is um, given out every year. So that's a very prestigious award and Cam was well-deserving. Um, and then we presented two executive awards also um, not awarded every year to Michelle and uh, Michelle O'Keefe and Morgan Monroe. Um, before we move on to the legacy part, sorry, one sec, Rike. Um, just, just a reminder to continue to get um, applications in on time. We'll make sure that you get notification. It will come out in whistle stop and we'll send reminders about them. Um, Mike or Tim mentioned earlier that the awards were pre pre presented virtually this year. Um, it was a very well received um, event and, and a great way to celebrate officials you know, in these unprecedented times. But I do think there will always be, in my opinion, this online component for the awards going forward, and there should be, just because then everyone can be included. In the past, you know, whoever could attend received their awards at the Cable AGM, but this way we can make sure that we include all um, award recipients going forward. The second responsibility for, um, for this um, subcommittee is um just the cable legacy work so we have done some pre some preliminary work on the cable fact book it is um it's a pretty difficult document to work with it's not formatted well and it makes it hard but i am working i've worked with jamie jennings and we've taken a high level look at it and he's starting to work to pull it together so that we preserve all the information um from the years of cable um and hopefully that will be in a good place before the end of this calendar year. Um, like everyone else, I wanna thank everybody involved with CBOC. It's a lot of work, a lot of volunteer hours. Um, Mike and Rika in particular, all your work as you continue um, you know, to support all of the working groups and subcommittees is invaluable. So thank you for that. Thank you, Martha. Is there is one question I'm just going to have a look. Um, so Martha, I don't know if you have an answer to this at this point, but Max Odette is asking, can we share the deadline date to submit awards every year? Is it always the same date to submit? Um, as far as I know it is, and I think we we plan to continue having it be the same date. And it, it the one we've always used or worked towards is August 31st. Not saying that won't change, but we will definitely share that early enough that you guys get it out there, get your applications in and, and you can share it with your membership. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. I'll let you carry on, Tim. I will just note that uh, at the moment, we're about eight minutes behind. We've got about a spare five minutes in the agenda. So maybe we're three minutes behind. Thank you. We'll uh, jump to uh, the working group updates and uh, begin with recruitment and retention working group. Uh, Chair uh, Rick Parnham, co-chair Rick Parnham. Um, Rick, um, give us a brief summary of the uh, working group's uh, report. Thank you, uh, Tim and uh, Mike. Thank you for allowing me to be brief. Um, I will try to get us back on time. The, uh, as you can see, uh, both Ron and I uh, submitted a report to the, the uh, CBOC executive and it's 
now shared on screen and in game plan. Our working group uh, was formed five, five, six months ago. We have met uh, five to six meetings through Zoom. Our goals uh, initially were to try and uncover exactly where we are um, with respect to recruitment of officials and, and retaining officials. So the, the ebb and flow, the numbers that we need, the numbers that we have, the viability of our associations, the rosters that we've constructed, those types of things. And it was really apparent uh, as we started to dive into the work that none of that data exists formally. So we're undertaking um, an exercise with a research consultant by the name of David Hancock at Memorial University who specializes in sport officiating research. David is helping us construct a survey that is going to be directed at PBOAs and local associations and boards to get a, a gut feel or best uh, knowledge base of what the, the trends are historically and currently within each local association or provincial body. We are also constructing a survey that will be polling all officials in CBOC. At least we hope that everybody will participate. Again, it's to get us some grounding and foundational data that we can start shaping what our needs are as, as an association to try and make sure that we're analyzing the data or, or we're collecting the data and then being able to analyze the data around all the great initiatives and uh, priorities that have been expressed tonight uh, around diversity and gender and, and uh, uh, geography and, and opportunity and, and pathway development. So we, we are at the infancy of uh, that work. We, I, I did have a conversation with David today for about an hour mid-afternoon, and he is going to vet our survey questions and provide us with a scope on the types of response styles that uh, would best analyze or, or best provide data for analysis. And we should have that back in our hands within a week or so. And then it will, we will take it back to our working group and then forward it to Mike and the team, and then look to implement uh, a rollout of both of those surveys in very short order. Uh, following that, we're going to be analyzing the data within our own team and uh, in, in concert with other parts of the CBOC structure, namely membership. There's a really tight tie between recruitment and, and membership so that we we build structures so that we know the data we need to collect when we register officials and we know how to manage that data and we know how to continue uh, to look for those longitudinal trends. So again, there's there, you're going to be inundated with uh, survey information, particularly if you're a leader of a local association or a PBOA. Uh, please do everything you can to get as much uh, data back to us, whether it be locally or provincially, and certainly we would we would love to have uh, all the help we can get from local boards, their leaders, and and just every official in the country when they see this come across your inbox. If you could please participate, uh, the the more data we get, the better the results, and the better decisions, and the better policies and practices that can be developed. Thank you so much for your uh, your hard work, everyone, and your attention tonight. And I look forward to continuing to work uh, on this initiative with you. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, I see no questions in the question and answer, Mr. Chairman. So please proceed. Thank you. I'll take a few minutes to um, summarize the uh, report of the membership and registration working group. Uh, early on, uh, membership and registration was identified as a, a high pri priority and uh, resulted in the formation of the Membership and Registration Working Group um, July of 2020. Uh, group membership consists of uh, Melanie Geran lejoy Jamie Jennings, Adam Wedlake, Amber Fair, Mike Thompson in an ex officio role, and myself as chair. The group has met at least monthly since September. Uh, initial steps involved development and circulation of a survey 
which was intended to research the past and existing landscape of membership and registration across the country. The data um, was used to produce a report describing existing structure or structures and definitions of membership and the various processes used for registering members uh, in the various jurisdictions across the country. That report has become a primary resource in uh, or for developing recommendations uh, for the design of a national membership and registration model. Uh, the key, goal, key goals of which will be to streamline the process for registering, uh, to minimize risks associated with incomplete or inaccurate data, and delayed confirmation of payment as it relates uh, directly to um, eligibility of insurance coverage and to create a system that is efficient, uh, enhances alignment, and is interoperable. Uh, when approved, the national model will be integrated uh, with uh, Canada Basketball's membership registration and management platform. And uh, we expect to submit a final report providing recommendations for a national model uh, later in the fall, uh, certainly by year's end and uh, expect also that the uh, national officials membership and registration model then uh, could be rolled out in uh, summer of 2022 to become uh, effective essentially uh, September 1 of 2022. That's the summary of the report. Of course, the full report is posted along with all other reports. Um, Certainly um, we'll accept any questions if there are, but um, otherwise we will move on to the next working group report. Mr. Chairman, I'm not seeing any questions in the question and answer at the moment, so I think we're free to move on. All right. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we'll move to the financial planning working group. Um, and Martha, a few minutes to summarize um, your uh, working group report. Thanks, Tim. Should be relatively quick. Um, you can see in my report the members of the working group. Um, I co-chair the working group with Rob Wright, who is on the call. Very um, invaluable information and perspective that Rob brings to the to the group. Um, and and we may build the group. I had someone else request to uh, um, to join, so I'm going to have a conversation with Rob, but. I think we'll probably grow the, the team a little bit. Um, initially, we took a look at the budget and looked, uh, really our focus was looking for opportunities for fundraising, but obviously constraints with COVID, no basketball, you know, limited funds. Um, we shifted our focus from fundraising, but we will likely shift back once, um, you know, COVID, hopefully, if it ever goes away, goes away, and uh, we're back to officiating. So for now, we are um, focusing on licensing possibilities for officials, um, game fee sanctioning for the, you know, all basketball, all levels across the country. And then we really are looking at us creating a selling story for the, the shirts just to just to work with the provinces and promote the shirts to the provinces and engage interest on the, the shirts that the new uniforms, um, you know, maybe we'll all be in them when we hit the courts again. Um, we determined that the most critical issue for our working group is really the licensing of officials. It's something that's been talked about with Canada basketball for years and years. Um, we did a review of the documents that were created by that Canada basketball group when they were planning. And for now, where it stands is we put it back to Canada basketball and we'll work with them on a strategy just to see how we can move the, the concept of licensing forward. Um, that's it. Thank you, Martha. Mike, I'll give you a moment to check if there's any questions. I, I don't see any at the moment, so. We're good. Thank you. And that brings us to uh, the last of the four working groups. Um, as I had uh, noted in the uh, report of the chair, uh, this working group um, is tentative or temporarily paused uh, to give uh, Canada Basketball 
um, some space to um, assess and research or research and assess uh, the, the potential of uh, a national insurance uh, program that would cover all members. Um, I'll uh, leave it there for the moment, other than to say that uh, once that work has been completed, uh, there's um, uh, in all likelihood this, this working group will then be reconvened and uh, the work moving forward will depend uh, to a large degree on what the results of uh, the Canada Basketball Working Group um, report uh, includes. Um, I'll uh, offer uh, Ron Young an opportunity. Ron is um, is uh, coordinating um, the uh, research and assessment uh, on behalf of Canada Basketball. Ron, if you have any updates or anything you'd like to share, I'll give you an opportunity to do so now. Sure, thanks, Tim. Um, so the work is ongoing from a Canada Basketball standpoint, again, in terms of navigating exploring a national policy for all stakeholders across the country. This includes athletes, uh, coaches, officials, uh, as well as directors and officers within the various levels of the basketball continuum. Um, I guess the, the, the challenging part with all of this a lot of times is looking at how we find consistency across the country. Uh, you know, every PTSO currently have a different policy with various vendors. Uh, and so our job right now is really sort of find that middle ground where we can meet everybody's needs. Um, you know, certain provinces reach deeper in terms of its directors' officers' liability. Some have more, uh, a more extensive abuse liability, uh, all of those type of pieces. So the, this work is ongoing in terms of having those discussions with all the stakeholders involved uh, and finding the, the, the appropriate uh, pieces that we will keep, need to tie into a national policy. So it is something that it is ongoing um, and we'll have more information to provide as we move forward. Thank you, Ron. Uh, that brings us to um, the Manager of Officials Development Report. And uh, Mike, um, the podium is yours to um, walk us through your report. Thank you very much. Just before I start, because I've gone to this mode in the presentation, I don't actually have an ability to look at the question and answer at the moment. So maybe I'll just get Rike or Georgia to check to see if there's anything there. Nope, there's nothing. Thank you. So the good news for everybody here is because we've had such great cooperation from all of our executive council members and our committee and working group chairs in providing uh, written reports, I had developed this presentation to basically be prepared to provide summaries of the majority of the areas that the groups have touched on. So while there's a lot of material here, this will really just be a review. We'll go through it fairly quickly um, and it'll just make the, uh, the exam so much easier because you'll be hearing it for the second time and, and just have some touch points. Um, so to remind everybody just what CBOC is. So we are a committee of Canada basketball. This is really important to understand that what we've done now is we've placed the officials inside the tent of Canada basketball. We're working together on alignment of the game across Canada, really about the Canada basketball strategic plan of unifying the nation and having officials part of that. Um, we're looking at leading and empowering all Canadian officials from the grassroots level to the elite level with a clear, consistent message and philosophy that's built on that alignment and standardization. We kicked off operations May 5th of 2020. As we, we are aligned with the Canada Basketball fiscal year. So in the future, most of our reports will sort of cut off at March 31st. But because this COVID pandemic year has been such a challenge, um, we've included things sort of to the current date. And at this point, it remains impossible to predict what year two will look like. But there are certainly some positive signs in much of the country. You've met all of our officials commissioners and been introduced to our Canada Basketball Youth Sports and CCA representatives. And I certainly want to thank them for their support. Um, the focus really of the executive committee, as Tim has noted, was really on building a foundation, building the governance model 
and focusing on some membership issues that I am going to take a minute on in a minute and our meetings with the PBOA presidents. Um, we've met all of our committee chairs tonight. Uh, they've all done a great job in taking us forward. Um, I'm blown away by what the Development and Education Committee has put together. Nadine took time to thank a lot of people, but let's, let's be quite clear, this, this is Nadine is the champion and the person that is really leading this charge and does an absolutely fantastic job. Please miss, don't misunderstand. Other people support Nadine, probably John McFarland at the, at the highest level, um, but, but this is Nadine's baby. Uh, John's focus on uh, his national coaches, uh, national referee coaches uh, program, uh, Cam with the exam and Martha on the uh, legacy has been great. Um, our, our working groups that you've met, Rick Parnum, Tim is the chair. Um, our risk management group, Rob Ferguson, uh, who is an initial CBOC commissioner, um, has stepped down from that working group. As we've noted, we've suspended their work at the moment. And then the financial planning group, all of these groups are working from a term of reference. So they have guidance as to where to work from. And we really appreciate their efforts. Uh, a flow chart that shows you our structure. This is important to understand what we began with here, that we have Canada basketball. We're in the tent, we're part of the umbrella. You can see our executive council, our officials commissioners, our partners commissioners, and then our, our, our standing committees and groups. Certainly we link on a day-to-day -day administration with the rest of the Canada basketball staff and our provincial basketball officials commissions uh, under the PTSOs, the model we're developing, and we'll talk a little bit more about in the, more, in, in the moment. This is a slide that I wanted to leave perhaps a little bit longer on the screen so that folks can understand where we landed in 2020, 21, and 2000 in comparison to the previous year. So in the last year that cable existed and there was a full set of basketball, the provinces registered 4,363 people. With no basketball this year, one of the big challenges was really our membership numbers. And is it important to note that in today's model, uh, myself and, and, and Enrique, um, salaries are covered out of those membership dollars, a $35 membership, $5, which goes into the general Canada basketball budget, 30 into the CBOC budget. Um, we landed at 2,935 members, so about 67% of a previous year's membership. Um, great variable across the provinces, you know, PEI increased. Um, the folks in the Yukon led by Paul Boutra came to the table with nine memberships, which was great, um, but some real variables. And it's very interesting as we watch this, as we move through what we hope is the end of, end of the pandemic, uh, we know that there's still some suffering and some real challenges uh, in some particular locations, uh, Manitoba and Minnesota, uh, not to say the least. Um, but BC has announced as of two days ago, a very aggressive restart plan. So we're, we're hopeful that this will not be the same challenge in the fall, but if we don't have basketball in the fall, we will have some challenges to work with people to really try and provide value for that membership dollars. But this is a key part for us that we really want to get this membership back in the, in the 21, 22 year into that $4,500 4, member range, and then start to grow the membership across the country with the initiatives of our recruitment and retention folks. Um, almost everything that's on this list, uh, we've talked about the 2020 education series. We did the FIBA OBR rule train, change training in the fall, something we may have to repeat, but we have the webinar on game plan and hopefully people can point to it. And as basketball comes out, we can be ready. Our elite training initiative with Dubrava, Dubrovka Martinovic that Nadine noted. Um, we haven't talked here about the FIBA game official licensing. This was is a piece of work that we'll go through every two years now. Um, we have 15 referee licensees and seven commissioners who are awaiting information from FIBA probably in the next four to six weeks uh, to confirm their status for 2021-23. And after putting this together, uh, we learned last week 
that FIBA has gone to the same protocol for our table officials across the country. So some of you on this call today uh, certified or recertified as late as sort of fall last year of 2020, um, FIBA has gone to the same licensing period and so you're being asked to recertify. We've talked about the level one and two rollout, the Women in Basketball Month, um, our work with the Canadian Elite Basketball League in a whistle blast that was released today. Um, all of the staff that Guy Cipriani has hired for the CEBL are listed in that whistle blast so you can see that particular group. Um, our summer webinars that we've touched on, again, a big shout out and thank you to the ABOA and Matt Callio, who really started this summer series off, got us going with the Joey Crawford uh, webinar that was used as a bit of a fundraiser for the food banks at the time, but, but really set us up well. Um, we have made the decision that we're not going to do that in July and August this year, but we have three webinars lined up, no dates officially yet, but in September, to what we hope is a kickoff to a basketball season. Um, we note our FIBA rule changes that were effective October 1st. There are no rule changes coming this year. There will be a new rule set in 2022. Nothing dramatic, but a, but a little bit of further development. Uh, our elite training with Dubrovka, um, our FIBA licensees that we talked about. It's very important to note that, and my last slide, we'll talk about it again. Others here tonight have talked about uh, equality, diversity, and inclusion. And we're really trying to make this a foundation of what we're doing uh, within CBOC, certainly within Canada basketball. Um, and we note that in the candidates going forward, um, we have uh, 11 male and four female to make up our 15 candidates. Realistically, we need to continue to move this to a much closer position of equity. Uh, we have an opportunity to always be a leader in Canada, certainly with our male officials. We are a leader with our female officials, and we can continue to develop that. On the commissioner side, Nadine and I stepped aside as commissioners. Um, we have six male and one female commissioner nominated. Uh, we would like to increase the female commissioners. The challenge in this is that the new nominees must be under 55, but with certain uh, experience requirements. This becomes a challenge in Canada because we tend to be late to the table in developing our officials. Folks, simply to accomplish this, we need to get younger. Our national certification program has been well touched upon. I also want to note that MP Mallow, Nadine Crowley, and Karen Lasuk have done seminars for FIBA Americas, for FIBA Americas webinars, and MP Nadine and I have participated in leading FIBA World Educational webinars as well. And at the bottom, we see that our equity, diversity, inclusion, trying to blend the principles into all of the CBOC activities. Our Women in Basketball Month, lots of support from people on this call and others across the, the country. Um, I'm going to focus on Cheryl Jean-Paul, the head coach at Trinity Western University in Langley, British Columbia, and Krista Ina Jokin, the head coach at Ontario Tech University. And Krista, so I don't make a mistake, I'm actually not gonna define the actual community at the moment. Um, and thank them for their participation. Uh, certainly Nadine, her Protect the Shooter uh, session, but this was a great discussion amongst the two groups. Both of these recordings are posted and available on Game Plan. Um, if you are an older white male, I will do everything I can to encourage you to go in and listen to and watch those presentations. Um, I think they really set the table for some places that we need to go as an organization and places I think we will go and we have real opportunities in this area. Um, certainly, uh, as Tim noted, Tim and I are meeting with the CEBL every, every couple of weeks. Um, Guy Cipriani has the autonomy to select his staff but we're supporting that with a recommendation of CBOC members. Um, there's a real focus on ensuring FIBA rules and philosophy and terminology are used with the CEBL. And that was a focus of their April 19th preseason staff meeting. Um, their season kicks off June 24th, seven franchises with seven home games. Um, and certainly we wish uh, Guy and the balance of the CEBL the best of luck for this year. Uh, really excited about our super clinic that uh, is this Saturday and Sunday. I think we've got a great lineup of speakers. Uh, I sent out some reminders this morning 
just to the presenters that were on for, for Saturday. Um, Carl Youngerbrand, who is the head of refereeing for FIBA, that's going to kick this off. Uh, Carl responded immediately and uh, said, Mike, hopefully we can make this the best webinar ever. Um, and I heard immediately from uh, Terry Moore and Lauren Holtkamp Sterling, uh, Terry being an NC2A veteran and a FIBA uh, level two instructor. And Lauren, of course, being the third female to work in the NBA, they both responded immediately with how excited they are with the weekend. That is not at all um, to say that our Canadian speakers aren't going to be equal to the touch. We've got about 216 or so registered as of the other day and uh, very excited for our Saturday lineup and our Sunday lineup, uh, which will focus on uh, a, a little bit more um, perhaps for those that are administration, but really for the average official, I think there's a lot here in the Sunday to learn um, about the future of basketball in Canada. Really excited about the last session, the assigner's role in uh, 2021. I think there'll be some great conversation to close off our weekend. Um, just for those of you that have not followed uh, international assignments that we have confirmed for this summer, uh, excited to see MP Mallow, Matt Calio, Michael Wieland, and Nadine Crowley on their way to Tokyo for the Olympic Games. Um, we uh, do have people that will be in uh, Latvia, the U19 men, MP Nate Saunders <coughs> and Nadine. Uh, Michael Wieland will be in split Croatia and Matt Calio in Belgrade uh, for FIBA Olympic qualifying tournaments. At least we, we assume we will. Uh, Matt Calio and I both had our flights canceled in the last two days by different airlines as we continue to see the airlines uh, change schedules, but I'm sure we'll get there. Uh, Christine Vong is actually in Florida at the moment at the uh, Canadian Women's National Team training camp, uh, offering some referee support there. And Christine and I are scheduled to be in Hungary. A um, little bit of a little bit of a pause, and I'm, I'm I'm not sure what's going on in the background, but I may find out. Uh, when I get done the presentation, I'm going to ask Ron to have a look at something. We've been working with Kahunaverse to finalize a new um, CBOC uniform. These are some schematics. Uh, we've had the uh, second prototypes delivered to the Canada Basketball Office, I think, yesterday. I believe Ron has them at home in, in a minute uh, when I come off share. I think Ron will be able to show you what the prototypes looked like. We're going to uh, uh, bring them out to our testers, give them one more go, and I think we'll be soon ready to go. Certainly, the national uniform will be required for national assignments after October 1st, 2021. We are going to work with the provinces and encourage it for the 2021-22 season. We will do what we can to... Um, uh, try and tie registration and uniform uh, together at the beginning of the year. We are working. Uh, we've had delivered from a supplier some CBOC crests. I'm also, when we come off of this, going to show you, or actually I think I should be able to do it now. Um, we've had some CBOC crests produced so that in the short term, the CBOC crests can be sewn onto the existing uh, old cable jacket and the crest actually covers the uh, crest on the jacket and allows it to be repurposed until we finalize the rollout of a new CBO, CBOC jacket. Uh, we are working on that and we are having some prototypes being built uh, at the moment. Um, certainly as we, as we focus, we have some work to do with uh, U Sports in terms of there's, a, there's not a great connection between U Sports and the conferences to the overall game in, in Canada. Um, games are being played with different protocols, university to university. We need to address that. Um, the CCA is, it's really nice to see there's some definite leadership at the national level, does not always translate to the local level. We need to work with that. And then there's lots of work going on with Canada basketball around club basketball, um, school basketball, uh, we've got to find a way to develop protocols that we can all work on in a standardized way across the country. It is on the list of items that we are working on. And uh, finally, um, as our priorities to continue to develop collaborative and synergistic relationships across the basketball spectrum, um, we have some challenges with the risk and financial management across the officiating landscape. Um, we have some worries. Uh, how many officials may we have lost? How many people have been introduced to their families? 
and won't be coming back to referee as basketball comes back. We know the players and coaches are going to come back full steam and we need to be ready. Um, really, if we can create results, um, they're gener generated through the unification of the basketball nation. And for all of us on this call, for all 4,500 officials in the country, what's really required is our collaboration so that we can deliver a structure that's accountable, transparent, and consistent through the administration of officiating across the country. Um, in conclusion, we remain fully engaged. We're available to support provincial rules education. This is a change management exercise as we transition from the cable model to the CBOC model. Our equity, diversity, inclusion is at the forefront of all activities. Membership registration will remain a risk going forward. We have an outstanding question, which is, are the PTSOs prepared to fill the void as we go forward? Um, I know there's some good work in BC, and we're going to hear about that next. Um, there's a strong need to develop the PBOC, the Provincial Basketball Officials concept. We'll talk about that in the next presentation, but we're focused on being a leader and empowering all Canadian officials from grassroots to the elite with a clear, consistent message and philosophy that's built on alignment and standardization. So I'm going to come off of share. Um, I don't see anything in the question and answer. I'm hoping, Ron, are you able to uh, bring yourself forward as a speaker and show us the uniform? I'm, I'm wearing it. Um, ah, there we go. Best way, best way to show it is to wear it. Not a model, but here's what the uniform looks like. Kind of stand up just a bit. So there's got the CBOC crest in the front. There is a Canadian flag on the back. Uh, the sleeves are, 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 are cup. And uh, there's, uh, again, the prototypes. Uh, again, the, all the materials is done. Uh, following very similar to what the Smitty's uniforms are. Uh, Mike, you can probably speak to a lot more in terms of the specs of it, but this is essentially what it looks like. Yeah, we, we've, got some, we've got some testers that tested the first prototypes and provide some recommendations for us, and we adjusted the uniform on that basis. So we'll be excited to get our hands on those and take another look. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking actually at John McFarland uh, at the moment because we make him go to Tim Hortons to get his tea wearing the uniform to see what reaction we get in the public. So one of our testing methods. So I will uh, pause there. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm just going to have a look because I was talking, I wasn't able to. Um, John or Rike, have you noticed has Diana Chan um, joined us at this point? I don't know that she has. I saw her before, but I don't see her at the moment. Okay. I don't either. So, so Mr. Chairman, if you are talking, I see your lips moving, but you're on mute. Got to get used to that. Um, thank you very much, Mike, for uh, that report. Um, tremendous amount of work ongoing. Um, perhaps while we're waiting for uh, Diana to join, uh, we'll move to um, item nine on the agenda and um, uh, membership uh, review. Um, Mike, I'll uh, give you the floor once again. Yeah. Tim, really, I could pull the presentation back up, but that was included in the presentation as we looked okay. at the slide. And, Very good. you know, I certainly, certainly on Tuesday, the BC reopening plan certainly uh, uh, I'll, I'll describe as encouraging and giving me greater confidence. I, I do know that even with the announcement of the BC reopening plan on Tuesday, um, it has caused, as an example, Canada West um, to, to go into action very quickly and creating greater confidence that we will see some play in September. Terrific. Thank Diana, you for that. Diana should be here. Okay. I am here. You. Okay. All right. Great. Um, Sorry, Mr. Chair, will, just, just before you introduce, I don't know if Rob Wright had a, had a question or a comment. 
Rob just went off, but I think Rob did. No, I'm, I'm fine. I was just letting you know Diana joined the call. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to uh, <clears throat> item 10 on the agenda and um, a uh, presentation um, from uh, Basketball BC collaboratively with um, John McFarland, the past and last president of the BC BOA. Um, Diana Chan is, uh, will join uh, John. Diana um, has been or is a past president of Basketball BC and uh, most recently um, uh, director of finance, I believe it is, with uh, Basketball BC. Um, Diana chaired a um, officials transition committee which effectively um, uh, worked or facilitated the transition uh, of BCBOA to um, the BC uh, Basketball Officials Commission. So Diana, welcome. And uh, Diana and John, I uh, give you the floor. Thank you, Tim. And uh, thank you, Diana, for joining our, our meeting this evening. Um, and Diana, I'll turn it over to you to start. What we thought we'd do is, is Diana's going to talk for a few minutes and I'm going to talk for a few minutes and then we're going to open it up for any questions and we'll, we'll keep on our timeline. All right. Well, thank you, John, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I appreciate the invite, Tim, and I'll, I'll deliver the punchline as we go through this. So. Uh, yes, I worked very closely with Tim and John and my call two colleagues from the Basketball BC board, um, which I think to the very successful end of bringing BC BOA and its operations into the Basketball BC organization. So what I thought I'd do is just go through some of the key success factors that we found as we went through the process. And as John and I were reflecting, I think we thought it was... Uh, we made pretty good time of our work and then realized uh, this conversation probably started about four years ago. Um, so maybe we can't pat ourselves on the back, but once we got some momentum behind us, we really went for it. So um, if I looked at sort of the, the key success factors um, to how we approached it in BC, and I'm speaking from the PTSO perspective, um, the first thing I would say was the alignment at the board table. So when we considered officials and the importance to the game, uh, we very quickly got behind a vision and a purpose and a commitment to what we were doing. Um, we also understood the impact it would have on our culture. And fortunately, I think um, we already embraced officials as a critical part of the game uh, beforehand and didn't see, um, didn't see it as a, as a separate part um, from Basketball BC. Um, so it was a strategic priority for the board and we knew that we were gonna have to allocate resources to it. Um, but this did take time. Tim was a, was a big factor in that of, of just one being a liaison member to the Basketball BC board for a number of years, but also um, being a guest at our meetings and just talking through the history, the implications and what it meant for our sport. Second item I, I would say is sort of openness and discussions. And that was something that took time to build. And I am referring in particular to the officials transition committee. So we had a joint committee between directors from Basketball BC and John and Tim on behalf of BCBOA um, and the amount of information we shared. And <laughs> there were some long meetings and lots of paper shuffling. Um, we put together a very comprehensive operational transition plan. Um, so it's, it's not a minor item, or sorry, I, I would consider that or make the suggestion that there is no minor item when it comes to information sharing. Sometimes we found the, the smallest detail actually had impact that we had to consider in our transition. Uh, the next one would be change management. Uh, and this cannot be underestimated. Um, in my experience and in the corporate world, more than 50% of mergers fail. Um, and when I say fail, they fail to achieve the objective that's set for why the merger was undertaken to begin with. So, can't emphasize enough, do not underestimate change management or communication. Uh, also looking at your risk rent management framework. So from a PTSO perspective, um, we weren't following the sport definition, we were following the governance definition of risk management, which included the reputational risk, the legal, the financial succession risk, and then um, understanding it, understanding the mitigants, and then documenting it. I, a great example I can give you there is around CRA rules. 
Basketball BC is a legal entity. Um, and as directors, we are legally and financially liable for payroll taxes. So needless to say, the ongoing discussion of the treatment of officials fees was uh, very heatedly, heatedly debated and considered by our board. Uh, number five, I'd say choose your team wisely. Um, there was a lot of interest, but we took particular care around the skills, knowledge, and interest of those that were sitting on the officials transition committee. Uh, and then we spent, as I said, time just talking and getting to know each other. And that was really important. I think one of the most important parts of the success of that. Um, when you have a, a, C, a CPA on your board that specializes in mergers and acquisitions, um, do as we did and put him on the committee. Um, the next item is to consider both the governance and the operational integration um, and consider them equally. So as I said, Basketball BC is a legal entity, uh, BC BOA was not. So we had to go through the structure, what did it mean, meant for our directors, our committee structures, our reporting, our bylaws and our policies. And then operationally, we had to consider what were the staff resources? What systems did we need? What were our work practices? So understanding operationally what is needed to um, support the officials and in particular allocation, and, th and that's not a nine to five job. And I, another area that we spent time operationally is the idea that moving a volunteer um, function into a paid organizational function um, was, was new and different. Um, so that's something that we had to, to really think about where it might not have been prop not properly, it might not have been completely documented when you have volunteers looking after a function. Um, the, le the legalities, um, I've mentioned it, I'll mention it again, but uh, get advice and when you need to pay for it. So consider that as part of your resources. We did have lawyers look at our legal agreement to ensure that um, we were achieving what we wanted to achieve for both sides. And then the last thing I'd say is make time, make time for the conversations, make time for the relationship development, depending on how your province or territory is, what is the current relationship and how much time do you need to invest in that? Because we found that that paid off in spades. Um, we also benefited for a year of COVID. There was no play, which meant we didn't have to consider what the timing was and the pressing need for change management. So I'm fully aware and very hopeful that none of you have to go through these discussions during a COVID global pandemic, um, but it definitely gave us time to get a lot of things right. And I will leave it at that, John. Well done, Diana, thank you. Um, I'll share five or six things that I, I think were integral to the success of, of, of the merger. Um, and Diana touched on a little bit, I think for promises, keep your committee small because uh, we sh it, part of it was relationship building. Uh, a good part of this committee was being open and honest with, with, uh, with each other. And uh, it's, it's much easier when you have a small committee. And it, it, we were very aligned from the beginning about being open and honest and sharing what, what it might look like. So that would be a recommendation um, for, all of us, I think the shared vision of how and what the alignment might look like for coaches, players, and officials, what it might look like. We don't, we're not there yet, but we're excited about the possibility of having everyone under the same umbrella and how we can move basketball forward in the province of BC. And that was a touchstone for us. Uh, uh, whenever we kind of got stuck, that we kind of turned to that and said, okay, we're in a little bit of mud right now our touchstone is how can we move basketball forward and that kind of helped us along um, which was great uh, and like I said we're, we're not sure what the finals that final model is going to look like but we know we're going in the right direction um, personally Tim and I found it a very rewarding process and Diana and I talked about it uh, at the beginning of the week um, as we as we worked through many many different questions and legalities um, it was nice, it was a rewarding process because we were making progress. Um, we knew we had to get this done, um, but it was very rewarding from a personal point of view and from a provincial point of view. So it was good. Knowing the landscape, um, Tim brought great corporate history to the position because he's been, Tim, don't take this wrong, you've been around for a long time in the role of, of an executive. Uh, for basketball, for BCBOA. And it was wonderful to have that corporate knowledge because 
uh, there'd be a question Tim would say, yeah, that was uh, back in 1996, we did this. And I'll be like, wow, good memory. And having that, being able to share that. So when you're making your, your committee up, get someone on it that has good corporate knowledge on, on both sides, um, really important. Um, we also found from the BCBOA that we, it was important to keep our local associations and our individual members apprised and letting them know where we were with, uh, with this merger, what the steps we were going through um, and keeping them informed as we, as, as we worked through it. And that was important. It was, and part, part, of, uh, part of the messaging was it, it started to come from Basketball BC, a call message from BCBOA and Basketball BC. And I, I found that, uh, we found that very powerful because we were all on the same page. Uh, the message came from uh, both, both parties signed off on, on, on the messaging and, and, and what was going out to our membership. And step one of the process was already beginning. That merger was already, already beginning. Um, the identification of the work. Uh, we often heard from, from Diana and her committee, like you guys are doing a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of stuff on the, on, the, on the go for a volunteer committee, um, much like the, the volunteer board at, at Basketball BC. But uh, recognizing that, the, the, the committee went back to the, to the board and said, we'd like to hire a full-time person. We think it's gonna be, we need a full-time person to, uh, to make this work. And that was for, for us as a, 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 a provincial body, that was wonderful to hear. Um, so I, I can let folks know that the hiring process is just about complete. Um, the, the competition is, is just about done. Um, and, and, the, and the person in the near future will be announced that the successful candidate will be announced in the near future. And we're, we're like I said, it was, a, it was a wonderful process to work through. Um, one of the questions, I'm, I'm gonna beat people to the question because they're gonna ask how much time should, and Diana and I spent some time on this on Monday, how much time should you plan if, as you transition? And uh, we said nine to 12 months would be about the right amount of time to plan uh, to do it right, uh, to, 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 to spend time and to, to hear people. Um, yeah. And again, like I said, very rewarding experience. Uh, and Tim, if you have anything you'd like to add, we we'll, would we'll, we'll be happy to hear from you as well. But Diana, did we miss anything in that? Anything else? No, no, th that, th those are, those are great. I, I think I missed my punchline when I say um, there's uh, sacrifices along the way. So when I talked about the board structure, um, one of the things was the commitment um, I had to the process. I'm actually no longer a director of Basketball BC to make room for an, someone who has the depth of knowledge around officials to join the Basketball BC board. And I think that just, you know, was open from the beginning on that, but it, that's some of the, you know, those are some of the decisions that have to be made. And, and I felt that from both sides as we worked together. Um, I think there were, you know, we went, we went a good stretch of not talking of, not not meeting on a weekly basis so you know weekly meetings right towards the end of just even half an hour of just checking in and i think that open flow of communication was was really important and the one thing that i did miss and sorry we wrote a terms of reference much you know kind of a, a guideline of how we wanted the process to work and that kept us that kept us on track uh it was you know we agreed to by both parties and it, it was important i think that terms of reference to to move us forward, you know, and that once we got the terms of reference, then we started, we started to make a lot more progress as, as we uh, work through the committee. Tim, anything to add? Uh, all I will add is um, that I, uh, it was a pleasure to, to be a participant in this process and uh, I certainly agree, John, um, it was rewarding, um, but uh, I, I don't have anything to add. I, uh, I think you've, uh, you've both uh, touched uh, all of the elements that, that I, would have, uh, I would have noted. So thank you very much for, for taking the time and uh, for joining us, Diana, and, and sharing uh, your perspective on uh, how your transition has taken place. Uh, Mike, I see your... Uh, you, you yeah, know, I, perhaps a I, question or a question that's been posed for John, and I think 
uh, Diana, it's worth you hearing the question if you've got a minute just before you go. Um, and John, I won't tell you who asked the question, but I will, I will tell you that you can pretty much throw, throw a rock from where you live to hit them. So um, asking, is there a tag in the governance model for local associations? So I'm not quite sure I know what tag means, but is there a tag in the governance model for local associations? And will this be a feature of the new BC BOC model? I, I, can, I, I think I can answer that. Um, in, our, uh, in our planning, there, there will be the, the BCBOC will have two, uh, two meetings a year with local associations. Um, so that, that there will be plan meetings that they'll be able to share with each local association. So moving forward, we, we know the importance of each local association um, and there'll be two meetings a year that will, that will uh, accomplish that. And I would just add, I think that there's um, the operational tie-in. So there's the governance tie-in to ensure that, um, so there's now, an, there's <laughs> the officials committee, which is acts as the BCBOC. Um, and the representation on that is two directors from Basketball BC and four officials um, who are potentially linked into local associations. And all of the local associations are voting members of Basketball BC which is another key component. And then the idea being working with the local associations, do, does that workload and administration come in under Basketball BC? And that's sort of phase two to consider, but in collaboration with the local associations. Great, thank you, thank you both. A um, Couple other questions are popping up. Um, I'll, I'll read it and then understand it. Um, did Diana say the change to a provincial BOC were result in game fees being taxed and T4s being issued. I mean, I'll, I'll leave it as to whether you guys want to address that or indicate where it goes. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a stab at it um, to be determined. Um, right? We're looking at uh, how it'd be our preference to not issue T4 slips, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, C CRA uh, has um, has this on their radar, and so there are considerations, and we've we've received uh, very good guidance, and now just sifting through that, and what does that mean? Um, there's certain limits and things like that when it comes to the CRA. Right. Um, I I don't want to. I, I haven't talked to either of you guys, so I don't want I don't want to prejudice this, but but um, lo local associations are still going to run. Um, and assign games locally, so that that is not being funneled through the through the uh, provincial BCOC. BOC. Correct. Um, I have I have a question, and, and John, I'm going to I'm going to. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure. Maybe it, it maybe it, it maybe it's Tim and I that answer it, um, and I'm not sure the question will make a lot of sense, but it says. If issues between the PTSO and the PBOC, can CBOC get or should get involved to reach same goals or issues that may be present? Um, I, I apologize, I'm reading the question directly. Does anybody have a comment? I, I, think, I think what I will, will indicate is that certainly the plan is that um, CBOC is in a position to be able to support the PBOC in what the PBOC is doing to ensure that there's synergies, collaboration uh, between, between the models and, and between the work that's being delivered. Um, but, I, but I don't think, but, the, but the, the CBOC is certainly not an arbiter of anything that occurs within either the PTSO or and its relationship with the PBOC. I certainly agree, um, Mike. Um, the only part I would add is um, using BC as reference, uh, the CBOC as a commission was not directly involved in the transitioning. However, um, myself, of course, being chair of the CBOC, and having that background and knowledge. And <clears throat> at the same time, um, 
being a past president of the BCBOA and being asked to uh, participate in this transition committee, it, it did bring um, you know certain synergy to the conversation. In that um, um, you know I had a better understanding of the uh, vision of CBOC than perhaps someone that wasn't part of um, the CBOC at this point, uh, meaning part of the executive council. Um, so that may have been a piece that contributed to the, the transition in BC. Uh, certainly, as we have uh, mentioned before, um, myself uh, and Mike uh, are prepared and willing to engage in any provincial conversation uh, to provide support, uh, resource, reference, um, and encouragement. But as Mike mentioned, we are not uh, not not because we 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 choose not to, but we are not in a position to um, to be arbiter in uh, terms of a relationship between an existing provincial officials organization and the PTSO. Mr. Chairman, if you're okay, one more question before we close off this topic. Um, sure. It's addressed to both Diane and John. Um, and the, the, the questioner is looking for a high level response. How do other stakeholders like high school associations, senior leagues, colleges factor into the BOC or the Basketball Officials Commission model? Uh, can you repeat the question, Mike? Sorry. Sure. How do other stakeholders like high school associations, senior leagues, colleges, et cetera, factor into the basketball officials commission model? Uh, that will be that we are working some, some of the working things that the uh, BCBOC will be looking at. Um, right now, okay. college is the only one that is comes under basketball BC guidance. Um, so I, I know in a perfect world, we'd like to have everything aligned. Um, it may not happen overnight. It may take some time for that. Diana, I know we talked a little bit about that. Anything else you'd like to? Yeah, no, I think that goes back to the, the benefit of doing this in a COVID time is there, you know, there are things where it's reaching out. Um, the, uh, the contracts that were established between BCB, BCBOA and the high school associations were transferred to Basketball BC. And then we've got a bit of time to figure out how the logistics work on that. Um, I think, as we've said, you know, the local associations and, and the importance of those relationships, that is phase two. And, and as John says, working through that. I don't want to put words in either of your, your mouths, but much, much like um, where Cabo had an arrangement to supply officials at one point for certain national tournaments, it's really now Canada basketball supplying them through the CBOC model. And, he, and effectively the same thing would happen at a provincial tournament at the high school level, that it will be Basketball BC providing those officials through the BOC model. That's my assumption anyways. I'll, I'll add one point to that, simply that um, the current structure of um, officiating being within the governance structure of Basketball BC, the onus is now on Basketball BC to engage with the stakeholders to ensure whatever requirements are necessary for the approval of officials to be assigned. Um, it, it is now Basketball BC's responsibility to engage with those stakeholders and ensure uh, whatever requirements are necessary are met. Diana, you had another comment? All right, thank you everyone. I note uh, Pacific time, we are at 5.03 and three minutes beyond the two hour allotted. Um, unless um, anyone has uh, anything critical, I think we will uh, uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll agree that the uh, the, 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 this past few minutes of question and answer will be considered our open forum. Um, I want to uh, thank uh, everyone uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks to the executive committee members and, and committee and working group chairs for um, 
preparation and uh, the reports. Um, I want to thank um, all of the participants and speakers um, for um, attention and respect shown in, in, during this meeting. Thank you, Mike, for organizing and uh, producing the um, AGM. Thank you, Rike, uh, your behind the scenes work and uh, keeping the minutes. Georgia, I know you were uh, assisting with production. And um, it's hard to predict what the next 12 months will hold, but I'm confident that next year's AGM will likely include more on the active officiating front. Again, thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay well, and stay prepared. Good evening. <laughs>